I'm looking around for these. You see all those power cables going up the side? Those are thick power cables. There's no reason for them to be all connected to all that stuff. 5G, huh? That's what's next. And this is what's going to allow it. Start looking for these guys. They're putting them in in inconspicuous places. Places that already have a tower that's uh, 100 feet, uh, 150 feet high. They'll just nonchalantly put these little rectangle receivers or whatever they are, those things, they'll just put them right around the tower that's already up. Um, we have here downtown what's called the Nut House, uh, Lansing Lug Nuts. It's our uh, minor league baseball team. Um, the Nut House is across the street and they have a tower that's about 100, 150 feet high. I just noticed that they put a bunch of these rectangles all around the tower and it's like inconspicuous and they just go up overnight nobody notices them nobody's talking about them and I've seen guys with their measuring devices out and these things are putting off mad radiation like it's something that people need to start talking about start noticing how often you see these things they're going up everywhere this is one woman's experience of living on the top floor under cell antennas for two months. Um, it started with my daughter. She initially got a rash on her leg that was sort of unexplainable. And when she was trying to explain to me what it felt like, she kept saying it was kind of funny because it wasn't hurting inside or on the skin. She said it was hurting in the skin. And uh, then a few days later, she got another rash on her arm and then another small kind of stranger rash and it was the same thing and then one day in the kitchen she was holding something and she dropped it because she said it felt like the blood in her hand went cold and in a wave along her hand to her fingertips and then her hand stayed about stayed numb for about 15 minutes some more of the symptoms include a, a sort of hissing in my ear um, in particular when I'm in my apartment but for about three days anywhere I went it would just sort of come in I kind of felt like an antenna and I'd sort of kind of go like trying to find the place where the, the hissing or the buzzing stopped. Um, I've not slept in my apartment since last Saturday, um, so a week ago now, and the buzzing went away after about three days. And also the feeling of um, tingling all over my body slowly started to go away, but I have noticed that whenever I'm in other buildings now or anywhere close to, I don't even know what, because I was never sensitive before. I'm, I'm no Luddite. I have, you know, I have computers. I have... All the stuff that that you know most of us have and I've never been sensitive at all but now when wherever I go I'm feeling the same as I felt in my apartment feeling dizzy and nauseous and a sort of a metallic taste in my mouth um, headache and pressure on my head and just feeling like I want to sort of faint or, or throw up and that's wherever I go now so I found myself becoming increasingly sensitive to my own you know my own computer and my own cell phone in ways that I never was before Imagine the implications of a weapon with no visible trace. A weapon that could knock out tanks, ships, and planes as fast as the speed of light. The same technology with modifications could disorient and even tranquilize military personnel, rendering them virtually helpless in the battle zone. These are the new weapons of war we will examine in this series. For the past 40 years, the world has been riveted by the threat of nuclear war and more recently by the prospect of space defenses using lasers and other modern technologies. But while both sides at the Geneva summit will be focusing on these matters, progress is being made in even newer weapons that could render any arms agreement relatively useless. Lightning is the most dramatic form of energy to be found in nature. Scientists have succeeded in creating limited types of artificial lightning, and some think that these could be the forerunners of a new type of directed energy weapon part of a family of weapons which operate within the radio frequency segment of the electromagnetic spectrum and are thus referred to as radio frequency weapons. Dr. James Frazier has researched electromagnetic effects for the Air Force for over 10 years and he, like a small but growing number of weapons experts, feels that radio frequency or RF weapons could be the wild card in the ongoing arms race. You could have tremendous amounts of radiative power and uh, what you did with that power then is a matter of engineering design and what what your goal is. Robert Bass, a physicist and PhD in mathematics, is working on U.S. weapons research. He says that the Soviets seem to be ahead in a number of areas and especially in RF weapons. We are behind 
the Soviet Union in directed energy weapons based on 60 gigahertz microwave beams. Dr. Bass and others feel the most likely form of Soviet RF weaponry would be high-powered microwaves, similar to a focused ultra-high intensity radar beam. It would literally cook humans and knock out computers and electronic surveillance and communications gear. An operational RF weapon, relatively cheap and reusable, could devastate sophisticated and expensive war machinery. The $20 million F-16 fighter, for example, is totally controlled through electronic sensors and computers. With no manual flight controls, the plane would literally fall out of the sky after being hit with a high-intensity pulse of microwave radiation. Scientists say that microwaves and other types of RF pulses operating at specific frequencies or windows can be transmitted with little or no loss of power. Machines known as gyrotrons can produce the massive pulses needed to drive these devices, and it's believed that the Soviet Union has a three to five year lead in this technology. Over the past year, CNN has repeatedly asked the Department of Defense and the Air Force about radio frequency weapons. After much resistance, DOD finally said that the subject was too sensitive to discuss. In my next report, unexplained cloud-like phenomena, which may be evidence of a Soviet breakthrough in RF technology. Chuck DeCaro, CNN Special Assignments. This is a Soviet LIDA machine. It transmits low energy radio pulses between zero and 100 cycles per second. In the Soviet Union, lighters have been used for years to tranquilize psychiatric patients without physical contact. This sound, which is received by shortwave radios in the United States, is generated by another Soviet radio frequency device. It is known as the woodpecker because of its tapping noise. It is broadcast by a number of high-powered radio transmitters operating deep in the Soviet Union since July 4, 1976. Though the official Defense Department explanation of the woodpecker is that it is an over-the-horizon radar designed to track U.S. missile launches, some uh, scientists suspect well, that the woodpecker is designed to interfere with human uh, brain function. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the potential that this has for producing a direct psychoactive effect upon the total American population is there, has never been disproven. Dr. Robert Becker is a pioneer in the field of bioeffects of electromagnetism. Uh, the signal range within which the woodpecker operates is that which has been reported by many investigators to produce a tranquilizing effect upon animals. We are just incredibly sensitive to these magnetic stimuli. Dr. Bob Beck, a Ph.D. in nuclear engineering, has done extensive research into electromagnetic effects on humans. The signal was permeating power grids in the United States. It was being picked up by power lines, re-radiated. It was coming into the homes on the light circuits. I was surprised uh, after coming here that the influence of electromagnetic fields was uh, almost completely ignored here. Dr. Larissa Valenskaya was heavily involved in Soviet electromagnetic research before being allowed to emigrate to the United States. She told CNN about Soviet research in electromagnetic effects. They demonstrated theoretically and also demonstrated experimentally that um, low frequency, low uh, um, energy electromagnetic fields also can um, uh, possess biological influence, biological efficiency, uh, because. Uh, uh, the, any field not only carries energy, but also carries information. She stated that the research was carried out on orders from the Soviet government. And of course, uh, the military were extremely interested in, uh, in uh, this potential of remote influence. Is the United States military working in the field of electronic mind control? Officially, the Department of Defense will not comment because the subject area is, quote, too sensitive. But CNN has learned from this government scientist, who did not want to be identified, that a Navy laboratory conducted research into the use of an RF device for counterterrorism and special operations. It's possible to entrain a certain percentage of a population, apparently, with weak magnetic fields. The study also showed that RF signals could dissolve certain types of rat brain cells at a distance, causing disorientation and nausea. According to the scientist, even though the program was successful, the government never followed up on it. Dr. James Frazier did electromagnetic research for the U.S. Air Force for many years. At one time, he proposed a battlefield RF weapon system. You could uh, make a uh, 
an antenna that would be carryable by a helicopter and that this could be expected to produce uh, a wide variety of symptoms, actually, by humans who happen to be standing in the beam. According to Dr. Fraser, the Air Force never followed up. At Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, another RF weapons concept is nicknamed the Brain Bomb. According to the book Star Warriors, the Brain Bomb would focus a nuclear blast into a huge pulse of low-frequency RF energy that would stun huge numbers of troops. Apparently, it too has not yet been funded. The Department of Defense will not comment about Soviet RF weapons, or if American RF weapons development is going forward. However, experts interviewed by CNN say that the Soviets are apparently ahead and could exploit that lead in a surprise strategic move, a move that could have grave consequences for the United States. From Washington, this is Chuck DeCaro, CNN Special Assignments. This is a Tesla coil. It was invented some 90 years ago, but now a growing number of experts in the United States feel that it may form the basis of a new generation of Soviet weapons. They are known as radio frequency, or RF weapons, because they operate in the radio frequency spectrum. Their existence is noted in this U.S. Department of Defense publication, which says the Soviets could use them to destroy components of missiles, to interfere with radar and other electronic systems, and even to alter human mind functions. The concept of RF weaponry was predicted at the turn of the century by Nikola Tesla, an American who had emigrated from Yugoslavia. He is best remembered as the man who invented alternating current electricity. In 1899, Tesla built this giant coil which produced 10 million volts of artificial lightning. From it, he theorized the possibility of death rays. This and many other of his ideas about the physics of electricity were ridiculed by the scientific establishment. Pure science is not a sure thing. You can't predict what's going to work out and what's not going to work out. Robert Golka, a research scientist, built a replica of the Tesla coil about 80 years later. Golka was trying to produce a phenomenon known as ball lightning. He also used the Tesla coil to conduct testing for the U.S. Air Force. What I was doing was setting in maybe five foot long models of advanced fighter aircraft and we would want to try to find out which part, of the airplane, which part of the airplane was more vulnerable to lightning strikes, whether it was a wingtip or the canard where the pilot sat. The These experiments the could also the demonstrate the effect of the electromagnetic pulse of a nuclear blast, and Golka says the effect of RF weapons as well. Golka thinks that Tesla's theory, that electromagnetic power could be transmitted through the Earth and its atmosphere without wires, is a key element in the Soviet Union's work on RF weapons. Tesla's novel weapons theories were generally ignored in the United States. Nikola Tesla died in 1943, and after the Second World War, all his papers and effects were shipped to his native Yugoslavia, where they were enshrined in a museum. Some say that that museum proved to be a gold mine for Soviet weapons scientists. We haven't even formally, so far as I know, to ourselves admitted that these weapons exist in the hands of the Soviet Union. Weapons analyst Tom Bearden, a retired U.S. Army lieutenant colonel, is among a small group of scientists and engineers who believe that the Soviets have perfected Tesla's ideas and are developing radio frequency weapons on a scale unimagined in this country. There have been a series of tests of these kinds of weapons, apparently, for a number of years. For example, airliners from Iran uh, before the fall of the Shah saw deep within the Soviet Union very large uh, glowing spherical balls of light which started out small and then expanded to very large size which are apparently uh, these kinds of weapons for use in an anti-ballistic missile defense role. Bearden believes that these satellite photographs are of mysterious non-nuclear explosions near an uninhabited island in the East Siberian Sea and that they are discharges from an RF weapon that uses intersecting energy beams called scalars. In doing so, you can create, for example, either an electromagnetic explosion at a distance, or you can create an electromagnetic implosion at a distance, the extraction of energy from a distant point. Uh, this would look like a cold explosion, so to speak. And I believe the thing on April the 9th, 1984, off the coast of Japan that involved several 747 jet airliners, I believe that incident was a test of a cold explosion weapons. At least it met all the characteristics. Pilot Doug Happ was in one of the five airline crews that saw an incredibly large cloud rising from the moonlit overcast below. Uh, it looked like a plate coming up through an overcast, and it, but it just kept expanding. 
I have a question. Which palm tree looks the healthiest? This one? This one? This one? That one? Or that one? I have another question. Which palm tree looks the sickest? That one? That one? That one? That one? Or that one? Well, if you said that one, you're right. Would you like to live next to a cell tower? But at night, it lights up really nice. Jose Lugo says these tall metal towers quickly popped up after Brooklyn Battery Tunnel toll booths came down. We don't really know what's the, the purpose of this. It's a $100 million MTA project full of secrecy, with 18 of these for the tunnels and bridges. So what are they exactly? Are you saying you can't call, comment to me? You know That's the good. MTA's man in charge of bridges and tunnels, Cedric Fulton, dodging our questions. Not even late, uh, later, can we talk to you about it? Or? Can I make it? Some MTA board members, including New York City Transportation Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, say they know too little about the towers, even with about half the money spent and some of the towers up. A lot of the board members felt like they didn't have all the details they would have wanted, myself included. Residents who say they suspect there is much more going on with these towers than meets the eye wonder, will they ever know what's going on inside them? I'm going to guess it's probably not just a decoration. It's a bit mind-boggling that the MTA is approving $100 million for what appears to us to be uh, big decorative uh, pylons. John Caney is leader of the watchdog group Reinvent Albany. What we're asking for is transparency from the MTA. We demanded answers from MTA Chairman Joe Loda. Some of your own board members say they don't know the specifics. The base of these new, um, uh, new pieces that are going up uh, include whatever uh, fiber optics are necessary for those homeland security items. In other words, anti-terror technology. Could it one day include facial recognition? We don't know. He won't say. I'm not at liberty to discuss that. So watch as more of these expensive towers rise with mystery tucked away inside them. In lower Manhattan, Dave Carlin, CBS 2 News.